the idea of a pure ACI network. Now, an ACI network can integrate with anyone else's network that already exists. You can have servers sit anywhere you want. Um, you could have one of my competitor switches in place. We can still do policy automation. We can still do the grouping. We can still do what I showed up here. All we really need is an 802.1Q trunk, or we can pair up BGP, OSPF, and the rest. But the beauty of the hardware of ACI, if you were looking at a full ACI deployment, is if we did it right, the hardware networking switching itself disappears. We have what we have what we call a zero touch bring up. You plug a controller into the first leaf switch, it discovers that leaf switch, then discovers the rest of the network. It discovers all of the topology, or you can give it a cabling diagram to say this is how I want the topology to look, verify that it's connected this way. It will then actually IP address all of the all of the network devices on a VTAP, virtual tunnel endpoint. We use VXLAN solely internally within the system. So let me draw up how this looks. I'm going to draw a, let's say, a four-spine leaf design. And I know I'm like an artist on the whiteboard here. This is just pure beauty. So spines, leafs, spine leaf design. Right? When we look at the way in which we do this, is everyone familiar with the advantages of a spine leaf design or why we use a spine leaf design? Does anyone want to take two minutes on that? Good, good. Ne oh, so you're network engineers then? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we have our spine leaf design. We look at this as two spaces. We call this the infrastructure space or infra, and we call this the user space. User not necessarily meaning your users, users meaning anything connected to the ACI fabric. So all of this is an ACI fabric. Internally, each one of these is a virtual tunnel endpoint. And in fact, in many cases, they have more than one virtual tunnel endpoint on each device, depending on what it is we're doing. But we use VXLAN to route in between everything. What this allows us to do is give you 16 million segments instead of 4,000 VLANs. So we can do very large multi-tenancy. We can do large scale amounts of VRFs for um, overlapping subnet. What comes in from the user space is irrelevant to us internally. So VXLAN here, this can be VXLAN, sorry, I swear I used to be able to write whiteboard, NVGRE, dot one Q, or untagged. Right? So what comes in is irrelevant to me. I'm going to strip the header if there's a header on it. I'm going to put it in a VLAN header, move it across, increment the packet counter one time as if it hit one routed hop, and drop it off wherever you want it. When I drop it off, I'll drop it off however you want it to drop off. So again, we want to make the network transparent. We call it network normalization. If I have a Hyper-V host connected here, and it's using NVGRE, and a VM VMware host here using VXLAN, and I have a bare metal server here using untagged frames or .1Q, I can move the packet five, about five microseconds, any port to any port, and I can rewrite from NVGRE to VXLAN to an untagged or .1Q frame as it moves forward because you told me this group connects to this group. You don't have to configure all of that and it's transparent to the end device out here. The end device out here does not know that we wrote it into our VXLAN and moved it out. If you were running, for instance, um, there's a very big virtualization company with a competing network virtualization product. Um, you may have heard of them. If you were running that on top of my network, I can provide advanced network visibility into what that's doing. And I can take their VXLAN, I'll tr translate that frame, I'll use a different VNIT or virtual network ID internally, and then when I send it back out, I'll put their VXLAN back on it and hand it to the device. Internally, we leave it all normal and we don't do double in cap because double in cap wastes bandwidth. So the VLAN example is compelling because a lot of customers are already using that and it's nice to be able to just say this, this VLAN is, it represents this network that I already have set up, just put it in and put it in an endpoint group and you're done. The, the stuff I think above that is, is where the complexity comes in because some customers have already gone to VXLAN in a multicast fashion mm -hmm. just because they've, they've needed to. Maybe they're using 1000V and it's a simple way to do that, right? Um, I think the one thing that I, I have yet to, to figure out is how the fabric handles that state being transferred from endpoint to endpoint outside the fabric. So multicast VXLAN has to figure out what Macs go to what VTEPs, right? Basically, here's the VNIN that I need to use. Um, normally, those, those multicast frames go through a fabric and they find each other, right? Well, ACI strips all that off. So what are you doing to 
communicate down to those endpoints the state that they're looking for? Is that something that you do, or, or is that treated basically as just a bum frame? No, what, what we'll do is pair with that multicast as it comes in. So we build multicast trees within the fabric. We can actually do multi-path, multicast, and fast reroute for multicast failures. Um, but we'll take that multicast stream and deliver it to the end devices it, transparently, the same way that any other network would use them. We don't make any change to how that a actually works. So even though you're, so you're, just, you're still stripping off the VXLAN because you have your own internal way of doing that, but when it gets delivered, the same thing gets appended, and that discovery process can still take place. Exactly. I'll know which leafs are participating in that multicast tree and I'll drop it to that leaf, that leaf will then know which ports it needs to drop it to. Um, so it'll build a multicast topology to know that and be able to deliver it back out as if it, you know, same way multicast works today sure. for your external multicast. Um, the other thing we do is our controller itself is the exact opposite of any other SDN controller out there. Any other SDN controller out there's focus in life primarily is forwarding, telling packets where to go. OpenFlow is the best example of this. It's using a five tuple or 12 tuple match to tell packets where to go, program a route table. Is that a fair statement? We don't look at packet forwarding. This topology comes up, it uses ISIS to build a routed topology from any VTEP to any VTEP, basically any leaf to any leaf. Our controller itself never sees a packet, never programs a route. It is never involved in the packet process. Our spines do some magic. Our spines can handle, in a hardware database, up to a million IPv4 or IPv6 endpoints, the addressing for them. This allows us to eliminate broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast on the fabric, at line rate, in hardware, without ever hitting a software controller to do so. So if I have a broadcast, uh, un let's say unknown unicast, hit this leaf, if this leaf does not know the destination, it sends a unicast message to a proxy on any one of these spines, that spine at line rate hits that hardware database, which can be up to a million entries, and then forwards it unicast to the destination, drops it off. Let's say it's an ARP. Drops it off. When it gets dropped out to user space, nothing's changed from that ARP. That ARP reply is a unicast ARP reply, just like it ever would be. When it comes back, this leaf relearns. We call it a zero, uh, zero penalty miss. If my leaf does not know where it goes, at line rate unicast, it learns it, sending it through the spine proxy. So there's a lot of things that we do in the hardware that enable what we're able to do on, um, on how ACI works and becomes transparent underneath. He blew through that fast. Um, I think I missed that. Because I didn't want you to ask any questions. <laughs> That's as much as I know about it. I, I, was, I was trying to take, take all that in, uh, in one shot. So the spines only know about VTAPs, endpoints to endpoints. Right? Yes. Okay. And so their routing table, all stored in hardware, is that where the Merchant Plus comes in? Yes. The Merchant Plus piece comes in there. So um, we have basically fabric cards on the back of the spine that are all um, based on a Broadcom chipset. So the fabric cards are based on that. On our spine line cards, that is the Merchant Plus. That is the uh, ASICs developed by the NCMA team, now INSBU. So those are the ones that are able to allow that million address database to be built and allow some of the other things that we do within the fabric. So basically the idea is here we have a proxy route database that knows how to get any IPv4 or IPv6 endpoint to any leaf destination, to the VTAP it needs to go to, which would be the leaf. And, and yeah, and then clearly the spines are ignorant of what's outside of the VTAPs or what's been encapsulated. It doesn't need to know. That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Okay. You had mentioned um, the APIC does not program routes. He doesn't do any forwarding, doesn't know. The fabric figures that out for itself. How does it figure that out again? You, I, I heard ISIS in there real quick. And so ISIS is the routing protocol between virtual, virtual tunnel endpoints within the fabric. And it, it does the automatic learning uh, via basically LLDP. So automatically learns, then it uses uh, a DHCP pool, which you can manually configure or allow it to auto-configure to assign out addresses on each of these links between VTEPs, and then that route topology comes up based on that. And so it's its own little distributed control plane that's self-sufficient and discovers new additions to the fabric, uh, knows that a new leaf switch got added or a new spine switch got added, uh, LLDP discovery, he knows where he at, he's at in the topology, ISIS is used to learn uh, all the all the all the VTAPs, all, all, the all VTAP. those IPs for yep. the VTAPs, and that will scale up to a million entries in that the merchant, the plus uh, silicon. Depending there. on which spine you're using, yes. Okay, and so that's so it is self-sufficient to get 
traffic VTEP to VTEP outside of the controller. The controller is just policy. That's right. So if you think of an open flow controller, an open flow controller tells packets where to go. Yeah. APIC controller tells packets when to go. So you do apply an application network profile. I already know how to get that packet where it needs to go. Mm -hmm. You're turning on the connection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now the other thing the spine does is obviously we don't work in isolation. So our ISIS router topology in VXLAN here is com completely transparent to the outside. But somewhere here you're going to have a router. Right? So that router can pair up to us using BGP, OSPF, or static routes if you want to have a lot of fun. Um, what happens is that once that's pairing, once that's paired, the leaf sends the information to the spine, the spine becomes a route reflector. So it puts those routes, external routes, into its hardware database as the proxy, and then, push, and then they get learned by the leafs as they're used. That would let me, a device here, know that he needs to send it to this or she, depending on the, the sex of your packet, um, <laughs> to this leaf to get it out of the fabric. So the, you, you said something important there. The, in, a, in a certain sense, the way an ACI fabric forwards traffic from leaf to spine isn't actually important. It's, it's interesting, but in a certain sense, we don't care. It's a cloud. It, we know we're gonna, it, the, it, the traffic's going to be delivered. We don't have to configure that. It's not, it just happens as a part of those switches being in ACI mode. Absolutely. So I, I always describe it, I'm probably going to get killed for saying it uh, on video, but I always describe it that it, so Tom Edsel was our CTO and co-founder. Tom Edsel is one of the best network ASIC designers in the world. He's been doing it for Cisco for years. Any product you use from Cisco, he probably touched the ASIC. Um, if Tom did his job right and if our hardware team did their job right, this all disappears and you focus on deploying applications. That is exactly what we're trying to do. We want to make this disappear, give you all the visibility into whatever happens when something isn't working. But we don't want to make you think about, okay, this is VXLAN, how do I bridge it and gateway it over to MVGRE and then get it back out to this. Each one of our ports is a line rate, stateless firewall, and gateway device for MVGRE, VXLAN, VLAN, untagged. Okay, so now this puts some context around something you said very early when you started this section, which is uh, APIC is still useful in a non-Cisco hardware. You can still do things with uh, competitor switches. C can you just... Say that again, and what you can do and can't do. Yeah, we can work with competitor switches. Um, so let's say, let's say you built this design, but you had some existing, and I'm not going to name any competitors, but because they're competitors, I'm going to draw them in red, because um, no one wants them. <laughs> <laughs> you can pair up to that switch. You can, you can have servers hanging down here, um, and servers are always in 3D. Um, you can have servers hanging down here. What we care about is that 802.1Q packet header. So if you have two VLANs coming in here, VLAN 10 and 20, VLAN 10 and 20 can be... Okay, okay so we're coming into an ACI fabric now. Yeah. You're saying, okay. Yeah, you're connecting okay, okay, okay. APIC to the actual control. Yeah, what switch. if that's not your fabric? What can APIC do, yeah. or if anything? Uh, today, today, nothing. Today, you okay. do need a small a subset, but I can actually draw that integration. Of, so this is one of the... If you have... Do you want to actually push policy or something? Well, here, here's the thing, switch, right? right? If you can do it in OVS, in the future, what would stop you from running, hypothetically, there's a vendor out there today that runs OVS in hardware, to using OpFlex down to that top rack switch? I'm sorry, APIC down to that top rack switch. So this isn't, this isn't out yet. It's still being worked on. But the whole group-based policy stuff in Open Daylight is very compelling. And it's basically aimed at that kind of thing. Because it's the same policy model, right? Mm. Not much different, but it, it is aim, aimed at working with other open platforms. Let's say you have an existing three-tier network, and this is from Vendor X. It is not Cisco equipment, or it is Cisco equipment. It could be any of the Nexus platform, it could be Catalyst platform, or it could be from any vendor. This is your three-tier network today, correct? Um, which layer, where do I enforce policy on this network? Today, with today's policy application. Where would I typically enforce policy? Ag. I'm giving you a hint. Ag. Ag. <laughs> <laughs> right? Ag is typically my layer three boundary, right? And a lot of times we have a maybe, you know, in the Cisco world, this would maybe be a Catalyst 6500 with services modules hanging here at the Ag to do firewall load balancing, that kind of thing. Uh, it may be service appliances hanging off here at the Ag to do that. So packets go here for policy enforcement. They go back to wherever they're going or they go out. Is that fair? So the traffic pattern you have today is traffic comes in. Well, sorry, let me comes in, out, down for policy, or it goes up, out, down for policy. Is that fair? 
Okay. So aggregation is your policy enforcement boundary. If you want to go to ACI on that network and you want application network profiles and you want service automation across layer four through seven service devices, virtual or physical, all that kind of stuff, what we basically build, and I draw it this way, this is not how you'd physically do it, but I draw it this way because it makes more sense in our minds. Yeah. You would build a small spine leaf architecture, ACI spine, ACI leaf, ACI spine, ACI leaf, 40 gig links between these, and then 10 gig links connected to your ag. You make me your gateway, and now guess what packets do? So this is a dot one Q trunk to your existing ag. You make me your gateway, now I see all of your packets that require enforcement. And now I can automate the service appliances. You can hang them off here, you can leave them hanging off here, they can be hanged at the edge, they can be virtual sitting in the hypervisor. So basically, you take one hop to me, I use a dot one Q tag to put you in a group, and I integrate with this existing infrastructure. Does this make sense? You just need to make sure you get through your spine to enforce the policy. Yeah, you make sure the packet gets to me with whatever that device configuration tool is on that equipment. As long as the packet gets to me, I can identify it in a group, put it in an application network profile, and force policy. The only production change you have to make is dot one Q trunk, and then move your SVI or your default gateway over to me. Okay. Now the next coolest piece is coming next year, we'll also be able to do what we call a remote leaf. So you could have a Nexus 9000 based leaf hang off this existing access layer or off this existing aggregation layer and still be a part of that fabric. And that gives me full policy enforcement for all the hardware acceleration stuff I do here. All I need is layer two or layer three network in between. So this is for integration. I did, um, not really, integration and maybe over time migration, depending on whether or not you're doing that. So we're definitely not designed to be a full, like rip and replace your network because there's like no percent greenfield environment in the world, right? Sorry, Joe, um, with regards to the leaf, can you, I don't know if you can tell us anything yet, when that's released, how will the leaf connect back into the fabric if there's something else in between, like, you know, some 6500s or whatever? So yeah, your things like LLDP, not gonna work. I mean, is it gonna be some kind of like a TCP session between that leaf and, and the spines or all the leaves further up? Basically, it will be communicating directly with the spine via VXLAN to whatever the connected switch is. Okay. And that's how we'll, we'll know it's there. Any other questions on this? Yeah, just to ask a question similar to yesterday too. If you have this, you know, four rack scenario and you know a, a common VLAN across multiple racks or common L2 domain, uh, you know, where does that default gateway exist for a single segment? We're back to that. No. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, I actually think it's. I think this will be an easier answer here. Yeah, I would expect so too. Run me through that again. No, I'm saying, so if you have multiple segments, right, across multiple racks, and you want to do inter-segment routing through VLAN routing, you know, you know where, where do you perform that, that, that routing functionality? Between, the default between two mean? segments, where does the default gateway exist? Oh, so we're a distributed default gateway. Whichever leaf you're attached to is your default gateway. Okay, e easy enough. <laughs> yep. Yep. Conversation <laughs> over. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yesterday was like a half could hour. You, could you dance around for a little bit? Mic now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was 10, I think, was the, the optimum number of racks. Yeah, so whatever leaf you're connected to, we do a distributed default gateway. That will make your routing decision. The fabric itself looks like a single routed hop. That if from a packet perspective, it looks like a single routed hop. Right. Well, when you say that, so troubleshooting becomes a little more complicated in that it's... How, what do you guys do to get vi visibility into what that looks like now? Because now it's, it's a mm. black box, right? What, what are we doing that we can see in into that and where the packets are going and... Wait, troubleshooting? I know. We don't need to do troubleshooting, but it just works. <laughs> <laughs> works okay. You kid, that's full of gin. <laughs> or whiskey, whatever it was. Um, so ACI never drops packets ever. It's perfect, so you don't have to troubleshoot. <laughs> Um, no, we, we do a lot of advanced telemetry within the fabric, so this, is, this gets into a bit longer discussion, but we have about five minutes, so we'll go into it. Um, within the ACI fabric, we have what we call, um, well, we have several things, but we call it a telemetry. Basically, it's network visibility stuff. So if this server is an FTP server and it's dropping packets, that's pretty easy to figure out on today's network, right? If it's dropping packets, how easy is it to figure out where those packets are dropping on today's network? Is that an easy task, a complex task, an impossible task? It's usually a tedious task. Tedious. Yeah. Yeah. tedious task, okay. So tedious task, same thing, uh, same, same idea. So that's one of the things that we've done here. We can turn on what we call atomic counters for either counting packets or bytes. If you tell me count FTP, 
packets, I can see that a thousand packets hit this switch, that they were multi uh, that they were multi paths across all of my spines. So they took four paths. I could see that 250 hit each spine, just for example, and I could see that this leaf only received X number. So I could instantly, in real time, freeze frame snapshot and say, this is where every packet hit, this is every link they took, this is where you're dropping your packet. Um, when you start to look at an application, we can give you, we do health scores. So when you, if you took Microsoft Exchange and you put it into an application network profile, I'll give you a health score of Microsoft Exchange. Microsoft Exchange is 100% healthy on your network. You can give that to your Exchange admin, visibility into that, have a dashboard that shows 100% healthy. I call it the not it button for network engineers because we're always at fault, right? Um, that health score is comprised of latency packet drop throughput in real time. Our packets are actually tracking yeah, the throughput Yeah, but if the application's not, if Exchange isn't working, they're still going to blame you. <laughs> you know, you can have a health score, but they'll say, well, your health score is wrong. Right, exactly, exactly. <laughs> because there, there really is that, you know, you have, to, you have to dig deep to prove it's not me. And mm -hmm. if, you know, I mean, I think even from an network perspective, we kind of see this as, as, as a black box. You, and if the application owner ever get, understands that it is a black box, that's that's where they point every time. Right. So like, how do you validate ISIS is working properly? Exactly. Like, do you expect engineers to learn ISIS? Probably not. But if they did know it, would it help them? So do you have access to those commands in the box? And if not, like other tools to just you know validate ISIS or validate L2, L3, things like that. Yes, you can through the GUI, the CLI, or the API, you can validate any any component, anything the system is doing. Absolutely everything is exposed from our API. On top of our API, we built a CLI and a GUI, not the other way around. Um, so you could write your own GUI to do inspections. You could write your own command line to do inspections. We actually have some stuff like that going on. Actually, Paul's doing a lot of work for some different things in the way in which we're looking at translating commands from other languages. But you do have visibility all the way down into how the topology is built. You have the ability to dictate what IP addressing is used, how that topology looks, and what the cabling topology is. And you're able to troubleshoot that. We put in, again, some other advanced tools that let you pull that information out. Um, I don't like to call it a black box because, again, it's switching. Um, and everything standards based but yes we have put in tools but in that, that, in that scenario you would never configure let's say 9k directly totally get it but in terms of when you go on to that switch could you do like a show isis database or whatever the command is to pull out data yes okay. yes okay yeah and we can send out SNMP and syslog messages and all the things that you would expect for normal network management tools you are able to get down and see at a switch level what's coming up um, so you can you can go down to that switch level and look at what that box is doing it's just exposed as an object showing you the attributes right. yes yeah, so that's sort of like see there's all sort of mentions like how that data is actually exposed and you know there's all the counters stats whatever it's all there so you know how do i get at that so it, i think it paul can, can probably yeah. walk through some of that in, in the sessions he's doing um because he's, he's going to actually show a little bit of this as he goes through that's okay. that works that makes sense any other questions on this i thought there was bgp and in, in within the uh, you know, the back end or the black box, if you will. <laughs> but uh, there was a mention of BGP in there today, was there? Um, so uh, we, we, we are looking at different things for how we, how we do our control plane protocol internally, and that would be one of the things that would be capable of doing that. So there's no... So today, sh let's say shipping, is no BGP, it's straight ISIS? We can b b uh, pair BGP outside. No, I mean within. I mean within the fabric, though. Within the fabric, ISIS is probably the better. Is, is overall the better protocol because of the scale and the fact that we're only hitting that many VTEPs, the speed at which ISIS works, and some of the other things. Um, but no, that we don't use BGP to route internally. Okay. Um, d is there anything I'm missing on that, Paul? Of BGP use. The only case where you use BGP internally is for uh, as a route reflector for external routing. So that all you know how to get to. Okay. Cool. cool. I have a Twitter question. Um, how do you intend to get TrustSec and ACI to work together? There are, um, there is a project uh, that has been submitted to the IETF uh, by us and a few other vendors called Network Services Header, NSH. Um, you can find the draft. Um, basically, it's a context aware packet format that allows true service chaining um, and then the ability to work with other uh, devices that are currently doing security and the rest. So over time you will see a convergence of these products and how they work. But that's all future roadmap and uh, I call it, I'll call it vision. By vision I mean I make no legal claims to the fact that this will ever exist. Another Twitter question. Um, where does Cisco lie with the leadership in open daylight? 
Lisa K. Wood. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Cisco is very aligned with Open Daylight. We are uh, working very closely with them. Uh, within ACI, we are also working very closely with them on the group policy um, project. Um, so we are still very much a proponent and push of Open Daylight. It is another way to do this. The Nexus 9000 in NXOS mode would be able to run with, open the, with the Open Daylight controller and use OpenFlow as a protocol.